All right, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third event in this semester's GCSC keynote lecture series. My name is Jens Kugele. I'm head of research coordination and a member of the executive board here at our center, GCSC. And I'm very much looking forward to our conversation during the next hour and a half on a timely and utterly important topic. Um, we are thrilled to be able to welcome tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Vitaly Czarnecki from the University of Kansas. Thank you very much again, Professor Czarnecki, for accepting the invitation and for joining us tonight. As you can all see from the large audience in this conference room as well as online, this event connects with a number of our research contexts here at the GCSC and RCSC. We're happy to welcome our colleagues from JLU's Chair for East and West Slavic Literatures, and I would like to take a moment to explicitly thank Professor Uffelmann and his team, particularly doctoral researcher Irina Tarku, um, for the wonderful cooperation in conceptualizing and organizing this event over the last weeks and months. Many thanks also to our colleagues at GITSO, JLU Center for Eastern European Studies, who is co-sponsoring tonight's event as well. I'm also happy to see our friends and colleagues from our European PhD network, PhDNet, whose new doctoral members have gathered here at our center together with our PhDNet partners for the induction week of its sixth cohort. A warm welcome to all of you and very best wishes for your PhDNet journey. Before Professor Uffelmann and Irina Tarku um, are going to introduce our speaker to you, just a brief note on the format of tonight's event. Directly after the lecture, we invite questions and comments from all of you in the audience. And for those of you who join us online tonight, um, during the Q&A, if you would like to pose a question or make a comment, um, please enter a plus in the chat and we will be happy to add you to the list. However, if you prefer, you may also just write your question or comment directly in the chat and we'll be happy to read it out. Tonight's event will be recorded. The recording, however, as always, is limited to the audio and video of our presenters only. The recording does not include the Q&A session afterwards, neither does it include any chat activity or any metadata regarding the participants of this session. Please join me in welcoming Professor Janetsky, as well as our colleague, Professor Uffelmann and Irina Tarku, who are going to briefly introduce our speaker to you. Many thanks. GCC community, dear Professor Vitaly Chernetsky, uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, I will start the brief uh, introduction of our guest. So Vitaly Chernetsky is a professor of Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Kansas. Uh, he is a past president of the American Association of Ukrainian Studies and the current first vice president of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the US. Uh, Professor Chernetsky is serving uh, in 2023 as Vice President, President elect of the ASIS, uh, Association for Slavic, East European, and uh, Eurasian Studies, and will serve as President in 2024. Uh, he is a member of many other professional uh, um, associations in the US, Canada, and Ukraine. Professor Vitaly Chernetsky uh, comes, uh, comes uh, from uh, Odessa, Ukraine. Uh, he received his MA and PhD uh, from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Vitaly Chernetsky held his positions at the universities of uh, Columbia, Cornell, Harvard, uh, Northeastern University, Greifswald, and uh, Miami. Uh, Professor Chernetsky uh, actively participates uh, in international events. Um, and since February uh, 2022, uh, he's been addressing the Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and the paradigm shift uh, in the Slavic studies. Uh, Professor Chernetsky is not only a great uh, scholar, but also a translator from Ukrainian uh, to English, uh, who contributes to the uh, popularization of contemporary Ukrainian literature um, and culture worldwide. Uh, he's currently translating uh, two novels by Sofia Andruhovich uh, and a poetry uh, collection by Ostap Slavinsky. And now I pass the word to Professor Uferman. Thank you. Thank you. I have the pleasure to continue the kind of introduction with a kind of uh, conceptual part. This is a special pleasure because my dear colleague Vitaly Czernetsky 
is an outstanding scholar. He forms an exception in the tacit rule of North American academia, especially Slavic studies, by his bifocal research, because he's both a researcher of Russian literature and culture and of Ukrainian literature and culture, adding some aspects also of Kazakhstani literature and culture. His main focus is postmodernism and postcolonial theory as regards Eastern Europe and Eurasia. He also does research in film and film theory and specializes in LGBTQ studies. Um, his specific contribution to the field is the intersection of postcolonial critique, postmodernism, and gender studies, especially queer masculinities. This you can see already from his seminal monograph, which came out in English uh, with uh, McGill Queen's University Press in 2007, Mapping Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of Globalization. In 2013, this book was translated into Ukrainian. He also has a fourth coming monograph on Ukrainian literature and cinema between the global and the local. He is presently um, co-editing a volume on Yevgeny Kharitonov, the gay classic of Russian postmodernism. He contributed the Ukrainian translation of Edward Said's Kultura i Imperialism, Culture and Imperialism, and has translated also into English, as Irina Tarku mentioned, not only the father, Yuri Androchowicz, but also um, the daughter, writer, Sofia Androchowicz, and many other poets and prose writers um, from Ukrainian into English. We are glad to have Vitaly Czernetsky here tonight with his talk on my own private Ukraine, utopia and queer futurity in dark times. Professor Czernetsky, we are looking forward to your talk. Dear colleagues, dear guests, it is a great honor and pleasure to be speaking to you uh, tonight. Uh, my big thanks to everyone at the University of Gießen uh, who made this visit and tonight's lecture possible uh, for the hospitality and warm welcome I received from the colleagues. It's my second time in Gießen. Uh, my first time was right before the pandemic. And hopefully, perhaps I'm heralding the fact that the pandemic is finally leaving us and uh, there'll be many more exciting in-person events happening in the future. Uh, this is indeed a serious and uh, challenging topic that I thought it would be very important to think about, and this is something that I began to think about shortly after February 24th of last year. So yes, we're marking 11 months now since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In the time of great trauma and great tragedy, we also saw the resilience and the spirit of uh, people of Ukraine uh, overcoming what seemed to be impossible odds, uh, gathering together and in the darkest times of uh, the war, um, you could see, and I think that is, I think, one of the crucial parts of it, uh, the spirit of Ukraine transforming, the vision of potential future uh, starting to coalesce, starting to come clear. And it is reflecting on that, starting already in the first weeks since the full-scale invasion, that I started drafting these remarks. Uh, the title, as some of you have guessed, is uh, a pun on the t and the allusion to the title of one of the highly influential films, one of the founding films of the so-called nuclear cinema, Gus Van Sant's My Own Private Idaho. Uh, 
And that is a film which has a combination indeed also of a darkness and of love and of a mo moment of utopian coming in together. And it is this quote which actually comes from one of the critics writing of the film and is available on the Criterion website for it, I think is, uh, summarizes the message of it very well. Amy Tobin wrote, my own private Idaho is an imaginary place where one is locked in the arms of love that is both protected and free. It is a promise of America chronically out of joint with reality, especially for its most vulnerable inhabitants. And this, to me, is an inspiration to transpose and to look at the context of Ukraine with all of its difficulties, with all of its messy development in recent decades, with all the struggles, including for the uh, queer community, and to see what has been happening. Can we imagine such kind of place of protection and freedom and love for the vulnerable, including the queer community. So uh, I will start by way of situating the talk theoretically, and then we will look at a number of uh, figures and creative works from Ukrainian culture uh, from the recent past. So uh, the at the time of when my own uh, private Idaho came out, the world, of course, was being ravaged by the AIDS pandemic. Uh, the uh, HART uh, therapy had not been introduced yet, and it was a very, very dark time for uh, the queer community. This was also the time of strong militants, the rise of groups like ACT UP and Queer Nation, and uh, trying to see what, whether it's a possibility to have the kind of social organization for change. But in the midst of that, in the rise of new queer theory, there came these contrarian voices that became very influential. And one of them, Leah Bersani, who in his uh, 1995 book, Homos, actually posed a question saying, should a homosexual be a good citizen? And his work was very much an anti-utopian move away from idealism, from human, uh, humanistic notions of community. And uh, similarly, his close colleague, Lee Edelman, uh, continued with a critique of what he called a homonormative political platform plagued by the politics of respectability that ultimately reinforces heteronormativity. So, there was a, a split, in a way, between theorists who um, saw a possibility of uh, the world in which there is a place for so-called misbehaving queers to exist and interrogate and reformulate the policies that were meant by the mainstream society to shame and stigmatize them. But for Edelman, there is no such future. For him, what he called a reproductive Futurism is a strategic turn that undermines the subversive quality of queer identities, and he rejects compassion. He uh, emphasizes that we need to give the uh, primacy to the id and things of that kind. And it became a very, very popular and dominant mo moment uh, in the discussions of queer theory through much of the 1990s and early 2000s, but there were, at the same time, a rise of different voices, of different approaches. And um, looking more recently at uh, the book by Angela Jones, A Critical Inquiry of Qu into Queer Utopias, she uh, suggests a very different approach in that she uh, says that we need to find ways for trying to craft utopic spaces um, and look at utopias and heterotopias that maybe not do not necessarily allow for complete emancipation or even guaranteed happiness, but they're suggestive of potentiality of the future, places that give hope. 
And these sometimes can come along with short-term failures, hence the reference to Jack Halberstam's The Queer Art of Failure, that has been a very important book in this regard. And uh, Tim Dean, in his critique uh, of Edelman, uh, says that for Edelman, queerness is structurally antisocial, and not, but not empirically so. And he sees that because of that, Edelman misses the ways in which culture opens up spaces for new forms of relationality that create potential for queer futures. So uh, one of the most important, uh, if we look at the positive visions, uh, one of the most important ways of uh, imagining that uh, for me comes from uh, my late dear friend, uh, Jose Esteban Munoz, and especially his book, Cruising Utopia, but also his previous book, Disidentifications. In uh, Cruising Utopia, uh, Jose uh, builds on uh, the theor theories the, of utop uh, theorizing of utopia by Ernst Bloch. And in that work, he looks at many different kind of cultural products. He looks at poetry, he looks at autobiographical texts, at visual art, at choreography and performance, and even at his own memories as a queer child. And he is trying to uh, figure out and map out how acts in the past can be read now in the present and utilized for the potential of the queer not yet there, for queer world making. He uh, look, calls this an, anticip an anticipatory illumination of a queer world and as a sign of an actually existing queer reality, a kernel of political possibility within a stultifying heterosexual present. For him, queer utopia is a modality of critique that speeds the quotidian gestures as laden with potentiality. And here he uh, distinguishes, uh, following Giorgio Agamben, between the notion of possibility and the notion of potentiality. And very importantly, he defines queerness as a refusal, as a dismissal of binaries, of categorical and essentialist modalities of thought and living. It is the quotidian refusal to play by the rules if the rules uh, stifle the spirit for those who, like caged birds, cannot sing and try to find non-assimilationist ways of developing a future. Side by side, uh, Michael Snedeker in his book Queer Optimism, A Lyric Personhood and Other Felicitous Persuasions looks at the work of several modern poets from Emily Dickinson to the present, and a building on uh, the uh, idea of counterpublics uh, from Michael Warner, he uh, s looks uh, at the possibility of through incoherence, new identities and new connections possible, and uh, finding a ways of what he calls non-Pollyanna optimism. Lastly, I think it's very important to look at the work of perhaps the founding mother of uh, queer theory, uh, the late Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick, especially in one of her final works uh, in Touching Feeling, Affect, Pedagogy, and Performativity, where she looks at uh, new ways of new reparative readings that I will look at more closely at the next slide. So, okay, so here is Eve uh, in Touching Feeling. She is talking about uh, um, love that can occur both in spite of shame and more remarkably through it. And uh, this is I, the key quote uh, that you have the first one. The speaking self does not attempt to merge with the potential surely shaming or shame figurations of its younger self, younger fictions, and younger heroes. Its attempt is to love them. So she t develops these two uh, combined two related uh, strategies of shaming and smuggling, a smuggling that is in bringing in something that the mainstream culture does not allow to be talked about, to, to bring with the force of our words to shame into negotiation and with the force of our bodies, and she talks about uh, things like political protest, uh, 
uh, in that sense, performatively, not merely to demand representation, but ourselves to give, to be the representation. Finally, one of her final uh, uh, ideas that is now um, acquiring a really important development is what she calls a reparative reading as opposed to paranoid reading. So paranoid readings are readings based on hermeneutics of suspicion. And against that, she proposes what she calls reparative reading, um, a less aggressive, less thesis-driven, less angst-ridden style of critique that would seek to repair the damage of homophobia and other forms of prejudice and violence, rather than simply revealing allegedly new and ever more insidious forms of abuse. So critique is important, but what is the reparative reading trying to do is imagine a positive future. And coming back to uh, uh, the work of Jose, and I'm not sure why the word got split, uh, again, transition from different computers. Uh, his a theory of disidentification as a hermeneutic a process of production as a mode of performance is to deal with mass, high, or other cultural fields from a perspective of a minority subject, and here we have the doubling of Ukrainian within broader regional things and of the queer within the Ukrainian, and developing something uh, similar to Stuart Hall's idea of oppositional mode of reading. And as he puts it, disidentification is a step further than cracking open the code of the majority. It proceeds to use this code as raw material for representing a disempowered politics of positionality that has been rendered unthinkable by the dominant culture. You can, through dominant culture, through disidentifying with it, make a statement that the dominant culture will recognize and will have to react to. And I've already talked a little bit about uh, Jose's cruising utopia and uh, he, um, just looking at the bottom of the slide, this uh, temporary reality of utopian performativity with potentiality, the reading, the practical example that he gives as how you can create a short-lived utopia through uh, an analysis of a poem by Frank O'Hara, Having a Coke with You, uh, which is a wonderful poem uh, that uh, if you haven't read, I strongly recommend. And it is deceptively simple. It takes a mundane act, uh, having a Coke with a person you love, and creates, uh, indeed, a whole universe out of that that makes it rivaling and more important than the greatest works of arts at the Metropolitan Museum, the greatest works of music that you can you know, hear at the opera and things of that kind. So the mundane act can be beautiful, meaningful, and future creating. And here we are back to Snedeker and his queer optimism and the idea of a meta-optimism, sort of a critically informed optimism and queer grace. And as he puts it, that uh, we need to create ideas of dealing with happiness that do not a priori doubt it, but instead make happiness complicated and strange. And as he puts it, beyond the pleasure principle, beyond the death drive lies the terrain of queer optimism that has learned from death, learned its vocabularies to the point of saturation, and in an act of bravery so unfamiliar as to seem impossible, departs from them. And this is, I think, where I think the history of queer community, the history of dealing with the history uh, with prejudice and violence and persecution, and especially uh, the recent, and still ongoing, the AIDS uh, pandemic is still with us, the AIDS crisis, the dealing with death, uh, staying resilient and strong in the face of it, I think this is where we have very important messages of empowerment and inspiration that uh, both uh, the queer community of Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, worldwide uh, can take inspiration from. And Snedeker um, mentions the final statement by Jacques Derrida, which is actually was read at his funeral, where 
you know, la survie in French actually means more than survival, but the idea of enduring, the persistence, the going on, is something that needs to be affirmed in the face of even the deepest tragedy. And this is, I think, is a very, very powerful message indeed. So, moving from the broader theoretical to the specifically Ukrainian. And it, as it happened, uh, in general, if we look at Slavic culture's serious research at queer histories, queer identities, uh, starts in the 1970s. And uh, in Ukraine, it is uh, the fascinating and the powerful story, of course, uh, was that Solomia Pavlichko, uh, the founding mother of Ukrainian feminist literary scholarship, and as a strong ally to the queer community, was the first to bring this discourse into public. And in very importantly, precisely because she was a straight ally of a queer community and comes from a very elite family. Her father is a very famous poet. She herself is, uh, by then, was a very accomplished scholar of British modernism, translator of T.S. Eliot into Ukrainian that it enabled her to speak very strongly about the ways in which Ukrainian modernism, like modernisms almost everywhere, um, has a very strong queer presence. Here I'm reminded of Eve Sedgwick's famous quote is that, if you look at every Renaissance, you'll find that every Renaissance, every great moment has a queer presence within it. That's when Eve so jokingly says, that's how we will probably learn to re recognize a Renaissance anywhere. If there is a strong queer momentum in cultural innovation, that's probably a Renaissance-like momentum. And in uh, the case of uh, Ukrainian culture, she looked at three distinct places of strong queer uh, presence. One of them is two canonical authors uh, of uh, the turn of the century literature, Ukraine's uh, greatest uh, woman poet and playwright, Lesya Ukrainka, and a a similarly pioneering and groundbreaking uh, prose writer, Olha Kobylanska. And the correspondence between them, which I will look at it in more detail shortly. She also looked at uh, queer themes in later post-World War I works of uh, Ukrainian modernism, uh, especially looking at uh, Domantovich's novel, Dr. Serafikus, uh, which was composed in the late 1920s, but only published in the 40s here in Western Germany in the DP camps. And at the time of her tragic death, uh, untimely death from an accident, she was working on a book on Ahatan Krimsky, and the unfinished book did get published. And this is Ukraine's greatest classical orientalist, so a specialist in Middle Eastern culture, sort of Arabic, Turkish, and Persian, who in uh, his creative uh, writing and his scholarship, we find a very fascinating, complex intermeshing of nationalism as a constructive liberatory force, queerness, and processing through Orientalism. And uh, she traces uh, it from the 1890s to his final ar arrest and death in the Gulag in 1941. And of course, if we can look at Ukrainian uh, canon, we can find that there are queer undercurrents present in all the canonical figures. If we look at the great Ukrainian philosopher Grigory Skovrada from the 18th century, whose 300th anniversary uh, was marked last year, and which savagely the Russian uh, army uh, marked this anniversary by bombing Skovorodas Museum. And uh, um, it, this is part of the systematic uh, way in which uh, the Russian state has been aiming to annihilate Ukrainian culture. Uh, 
Um, one of the uh, fascinating documents from Skovaradais, a relationship with his you know, beloved disciple Kovalinsky, the very extensive uh, correspondence between them, and as well as in some of the poetry, including uh, poetry in Latin, we find that there is a strong presence of you know, homoeroticism. We can look at similar things in the founding father in modern vernacular Ukrainian literature, Ivan Kotlerevsky, who was a lifelong confirmed bachelor, who uh, had all of these interesting you know, things about his life, who was a theater kid, so he really liked the theater, and so on and so forth. There are many elements where you can find something that yields itself well for a queer reading. The greatest national poet himself, Taras Shevchenko. Um, in fact, some of the conservative people within uh, the ma mainstream Ukrainian culture, they have attacked Western scholars, not yours truly, by others, by daring to suggest that there is a possibility for you know, queer undertones in Shevchenko's work, both in his literature and his visual art. If you think of how one of the most powerful statements of anti-colonial solidarity come into being, Taras Shevchenko's great poem, Kafkaz. It is mourning uh, a person he loved. I mean, it doesn't matter whether this love was erotic or not erotic, whether it was consummated or not consummated. It was deep love to another man, Yakiv de Balmen, who was a dear friend who was conscripted against his will in the Russian army and died in the war in the Caucasus just a few weeks later. And Shevchenko in this poem both formulates in a ways we will not hear in, uh, until like 1950s and uh, the war in Algeria, uh, the kind of solidarity of the oppressed of the colonized across racial, ethnic, and linguistic divides with the indigenous population of the Caucasus, and simultaneously mourning the person he loved for dying tragic, absurd death, fighting for the army of the invader, fighting with the army of the colonizer, while he was a just and noble person who did not believe in that imperial project. And I put whole here in the parentheses, in fact, if you think of it, the whole project of queering uh, Slavic literature started with uh, late Simon Karolinsky's uh, book, uh, The Sexual Labyrinth of Nikolai Gogol, published in 1976, which gave the first groundbreaking sort of queer reading of a classic Slavic author. And from there, things only developed. So in Google, again, there's plenty of places to dig in. Read Professor Karolinsky's book, and there are lots of other scholarship that has been done since then. So here we are back to Olga Kobelianska and Lesya Ukrainka. And if we look at Kobelianska's work, it actually is a wonderful long short story that was written before the two writers met, Vals Melancholik, uh, that is probably one of the founding sort of you know, queer texts in Ukrainian literature in modern sense, where we have, if you wish, a menage a trois, happy love triangle, or a somewhat tense love triangle of three women who live together. Hanna, a visual artist, Sofia, a musician, and Marta, a school teacher. It is narrated by Martha. There is tragedy, as often happens in you know, pre-stone wall type queer writing. So one of them dies, and they go their separate ways. But there is that utopian moment, utopian possibility of happiness that was this short-lived but realized. And then what happened is from 1899, so a year after the publication of, of Vals Melancholik, until Lesya Ukrainka's death from tuberculosis, so for 14 years, they had this intensely passionate correspondence that was written in gender ambiguous ways. Uh, somebody blonde or somebody brunette. 
even with a little diminutive words like Tosichok. And of course, we have here Tamara Hunderova, an outstanding scholar of Ukrainian literature who wrote a whole monograph on Kobylanska. So I feel a bit like an imposter talking about her in Tamara's presence. But also a lot of use of German. And my German is not, you know, very good at all, but Liebe Ferne Lotus Blume, this is an address, and Ihren Armen Schwan. So the, these are the kind of words that you know, we uh, have in those things. And they only met in person once during that time. But the correspondence remained intense and passionate, as I said, until Lesi Ukrainka's death. Looking at Ahatan Hokrimsky, here the intersection of love and shame as something that I talked about and as uh, Eve Sedwick analyzes in her work is very important here. So Krimsky was a major scholar of Arabic, Persian, and Turkish languages and literatures. Um, his academic output is really prolific, dozens and dozens of books. And he received a stipend from the Russian Imperial Academy of Sciences, which he spent in Beirut, then under Ottoman rule. Uh, for nearly three years. And it was there, you could you know, compare it to Andre Gide's Immoraliste or others, you know, so they travel to the Mediterranean and something happens, they realize their true self, uh, they struggle with feelings, they try to write about those feelings. And so we have, in the case of uh, Krimsky, his poetry collection called Palm of Ahila, so Palm Fronts, which exists in three different expanding versions from 1901, 1908, and 1923, and a collection of short stories, Beirut stories, which was published in 1906. And also uh, his only novel, Andriy Lahovsky, the first half of it was published in 1905, and the full text typeset in 1919, but not released, and finally published only in 1972, a very interesting text as well, um, where, which is partly autobiographically based, and in both the poetry and the short stories and in the novel, we have a central male character who clearly is in love with another man and struggles with that feeling and has a lot of shame and guilt and it's, cannot find a resolution. So on the one hand, you can say that this is not, say, as advanced as we had in Russia in the case of Mikhail Kuzmin, who in his first Russian you know, queer novel, Wings, published in 1906, actually gives us a happy love and a happy ending of the kind that was not even possible in Western literatures. But Krimsky actually predates Kuzmin by quite a few years, and he continues I mean, he's much more sort of psychoanalytically invested, which Kuzmin was not. Kuzmin was sort of this um, happy, sort of Renaissance-like balanced person, uh, while that clearly was not Krimsky's nature. And we have more research being done on Krimsky, and one of the greatest you know, young scholars of Ukrainian culture, especially Ukrainian queer culture, Alexander Averbuch, uh, has had access to Krimsky's private archive, and so there are many more revelations hopefully coming. One of the saddest stories of Krimsky's life is his last tragic love. Mikola Levchenko, a much younger man who became Krimsky's secretary in the 1920s, was arrested by the Soviets in 1929, and he was tortured as he was interrogated, but he did not say anything incriminating Krimsky. So Levchenko was sent to Solovki to the notorious uh, camp, uh, and Krimsky stayed. And Krimsky also legally adopted uh, Levchenko's son as a, as a caretaker. But tragically, uh, when uh, Levchenko returned from the camps, uh, he was so traumatized by the whole experience that he committed suicide shortly thereafter, and that was a huge blow for Krimsky himself, as you can imagine. So uh, there is so, this is a great story of which you know many books can be written about, and it remained hidden, and it's only now 
being truly revealed and truly realized, and I think it is very important that more comes to be, no, uh, to be known about it. And if we shift to visual arts, uh, Ukraine was similarly a rich place. And just to give one example from the early uh, 20th century, we have Savod Moksimovich, whom people came to call the Ukrainian Aubrey Beardsley. He tragically committed suicide at the age of 20. An absolutely amazing artist from him, only about you know, two dozen works remain, but many of them are huge canvases. Uh, some of them on display at the National Art Museum in Kiev, of course, now in storage uh, because of the war. So this actually you see from the uh, stairwell of the museum where we have this cutout display based on Maximovich's self-portrait and one of his signature paintings there as an example. So this is an example of Ukrainian bohemianism. Apparently in Poltava, uh, there was a painter by the name of Ivan Myasoyedov who really uh, was cultivating a sort of uh, decadent bohemian style and Poltava remarkably became one of the centers of those things. And uh, this is where Maximovich you know, came of age and came into being. Uh, basically, uh, apparently, he was a very ambitious young man, and uh, the critics panned the first exhibition of his artwork, and he was so traumatized by that that, you know, he took his own life. So uh, a very tragic story, but fortunately, his art has survived. Obviously, it was banned and hidden during Soviet rule and only revealed after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And moving forward, uh, one of the uh, names I already mentioned earlier, uh, Viktor Petrov, um, a fascinating scholar and also a writer of literature under the pen name Vedomontovic, uh, a fascinating figure who um, apparently may have been a double agent for both Nazi Germany and Stalinist Soviet Union. He was evacuated to the Urals in 41, and then reappeared in Nazi uniform and occupied Ukraine in the winter of 41, 42. He then uh, was living in Munich and commuting between Munich and the Mittenwald DP camp, and everything was fine, and he was one of the leaders of the Ukrainian emigre intellectual life, and there was a major flowering of it in uh, the the Allied uh, occupation zones and Western Germany in the late 40s, until he just disappears from his Munich apartment and reappears in Moscow. And then he awards Soviet military decoration. He's buried in a Soviet military cemetery. So a crazy, crazy story. And among all those wonderful things, we have his novel, Dr. Seraphicus, which is the first non-judgmental and supportive description of love between two men, among other things. There are a lot of other interesting things happening in that novel. And I don't, I'm not sure if it was translated into German or not, but I think if more classics are to be translated, it should be high on the list. Really, really wonderful text. The quirky language, the power of observation, even the gossipy nature of it about Kiev of 19-teens and 1920s is just absolutely remarkable. And we're moving to the still living classic here in Germany, in Munich, Emma Andievska. She is a wonderful second, third, gener third generation modernist, I guess, writer, experimental author of both poetry and prose who, again, we would call an ally of the queer community who just felt it was very important to give it a non-judgmental voice. And so it happened in the early 60s for the first time within this very, very conservative uh, Ukrainian diasporic circles, uh, which were very anti-communist, which were very suspicious of all leftist causes and all various liberations. Uh, she publishes a collection of poetry, Ryby Rozmir, which translates as Fish and Dimension, uh, which uh, included poetry which was signed as her original poetry and two large sections that were identified as translations. But what she did, she invented two poets and wrote poems that she presented as translations of those invented poets' works. Uh, one of them was a, a sort of like Kavafi-like 
Greek poet uh, by the name of Aristodemus Lichnos, who was an even more radical, even your, even more your face Kavafi, who would, you know, would be even stronger and non-mincing words about his passionate love. Another one was a Harlem Renaissance poet who was, I guess, uh, like um, very much like you know, radical people like Claude McKay or like later you know, uh, poets from the 60s like Amiri Baraka in that sense. And then she returns to that later in 2002 in her collection Hwili Waves, she creates a classical Persian poet and writes a lot of uh, poetry with male homoeroticism at its center, but at this time it's an invented classical Persian poet that she gives voice to. If we move to visual arts and music, and this is a wonderful um, person and you know a musical group that you know people should be aware of, and this is Anatoly Belov and his queer punk band Lutska Podoba. Uh, uh, he is now a refugee in Austria uh, with his niece, uh, for which he is the legal guardian. In fact, there's a wonderful Ukrainian documentary film about him, which is called Tato, Mom, and Brat. Uh, my dad is my mother's brother, where it's his uh, sister has um, problems, medical problems, including psychological problems and uh, you know, substance abuse, so he became the legal guardian, the legal parent of his niece. And so we have this contemporary artist who is part of all those contemporary art circles, you know, who is also plays in a queer punk band with a six-year-old girl in tow going to all the different events and this observational documentary following him. Uh, really, really powerful. So on the right, you see a DJ set in Hydro Park, and that's uh, Tolik, and the T-shirt actually has his drawings. He's a very active as a visual artist doing the kind of pen and ink black and white drawings that many of them he placed as graffiti in different cities uh, in throughout the uh, 90s and 2020 teens. And on the left, you see him again in front of a experimental film uh, that uh, he shot and that was uh, uh, funded by the Pinchuk Art Center for the Pinchuk Prize back in 2013. And it's called Sex, Medicine, Rock and Roll. And it's a 12 minute sort of ex extended music video experimental dance thing where he himself you know, is one of the cameos uh, in the background. Very, very interesting work. I know of no such thing of any other po po country of the post-Soviet region in terms of you know, the boldness of vision. And here comes Ivan Kozlenko, who's uh, the, the, the cover of his book uh, we have as an image for the poster for today's talk. Uh, Kozlenko is best known as one of the leading figures in Ukrainian film scholarship and getting Ukrainian classic cinema better known and appreciated. But uh, he also wrote this really important novel called Tangier, or as in Tangier, the city in Morocco, where you know, William Burroughs, Paul Balls, and you know, others were based. And it, to me, is a fascinating work in that it creates a utopian possibility through working with the concept of multidirectional memory in Odessa's case, where he really tries to create an alternative past for the city to find buried elements of its early history, reject the stereotypes of the commercial tourist industry and of the kind of stereotypical image of Odessa that we get from Russian literature and from post-Soviet commercial uh, Russian cinema and television. So what he did, he borrowed the structure of the novel for the novel from Michael Cunningham's The Hours, where uh, for those of you who haven't read the novel uh, or seen the film adaptation, the structure is based on Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. So we have, uh, something about Virginia Woolf. We have a 1950s character who reads the novel and we have characters set in the present who, as it were, are reliving the experiences of the characters of Mrs. Dalloway, but in modern day New York. Um, 
Kozlenko takes Yuri Yanovsky's Meister Korabla and Master of the Ship, which is a seminal text of Ukrainian literary revival of, uh, of the 1920s, which was written by a very young man. Yanovsky was in his mid-20s at the time, has this very bold experimental novel. And he deals with things that are in that text um, and uh, re imagines them um, where uh, he places some bolder accents in what was happening in the 1920s. And simultaneously there too, there's a triangular relationship in the 20s that we have between the characters who are based on Yanovsky himself, Alexander Dovzhenko, the great filmmaker, and Ita Penso, who was an Ital uh, uh, ethnically Italian ballerina at the Odessa Opera House who later had a very tragic life, who uh, went through the gulag, but you know, was still alive in the 1970s, uh, and uh, rethinks that, plus we also have a contemporary triangle. And for those of you who like passionate love scenes and great works of literature, I can tell you that there is a passionate love scene between Yanovsky and Dovzhenko in that novel, and that's something that did scandalize qu quite some people, many people in Ukraine, but the book did not receive homophobic attacks. There have been cases like that earlier with the first queer publications in the late 90s, early 2000s. So there was uh, vandalism and things of that kind. And it shows how far Ukraine came that by the time the, it was published in book version in 2017, the reception was overwhelmingly positive. The book was shortlisted for the BBC Ukrainian Book of the Year Prize. And uh, I promised Ivan that I would translate it into English. And as soon as I'm done with Felix Savstria, which should be out this summer, this is the next one that I'm going to focus on. Uh, we, in the diversity of voices, I also would like to emphasize another person who is now a refugee in Austria, and this is Friedrich Chernyshov, also known as Fritz von Klein, who is a trans male poet and activist, uh, originally from Donetsk. Uh, later, he was based in Kiev, and you know now is based in Vienna, and he is a Russian language poet. And he has a very complicated relationship with the Ukrainian language situation. As a person from Donetsk, also as somebody who was bullied and abused as a child and who apparently had a really horrible Ukrainian language teacher in secondary school. So this is from a poem of his uh, from June 2022. And for those of you who read Russian, um, um, you can see that, but the poem uh, describes a love relationship with the, Ukra with the Ukrainian speaking person and how uh, Friedrich feels that my language is now my enemy. When I speak in this language with you, my Ukrainian speaking uh, kid, I feel in my mouth something that cannot be overcome even with a kiss a bitterness of betrayal. So the language is fundamentally tainted for him, but it is his native language. And even in a situation when you're making love, if you're speaking to your beloved, you speak the language that you are capable of speaking. But he, of course, is he's learning Ukrainian in Vienna now, because I mean, he had a passive knowledge of the language to the point to be comfortable speaking it. So this is something we see happening with a lot of people from Ukraine who are not native speakers of Ukrainian, who maybe had a passive knowledge, but never had enough speaking practice. So this is a case of Friedrich too. We also have situations uh, in contemporary Ukrainian queer culture, like the provo provocative gesture of Adim Yakovlev, who is also a refugee now in Berlin. Uh, uh, Yakovlev identifies as bi-gender and non-binary and published uh, a novel called Tam de Pochenaitse Territoria, where territory begins back in 2020, and that's this very post Deleuzian, post William Burroughs adventure novel uh, slash philosophical treatise where transgender characters operate as a completely normal thing in a 
Ukraine of the near future, but there are also strange, weird things happening there too, as in some separatist countries appearing with different ideologies. And, you know, so the book is, yes, a very post William Burroughs kind of strange trip, but it asks very interesting questions. Some of these questions are a little difficult to deal with in the face of the full-scale invasion, but still, it is a book that is definitely worth greater attention. And uh, in closing, I would like to, uh, almost closing, mention A Stop Zemlya, a film that is received its international release under the same title, a film that won a prize at Berlinale, uh, and this is another sort of beautiful utopian vision. It's a group of young people in the final year of secondary school, and at the center are two women and a man, and uh, they are best friends. Uh, and uh, the woman who looks at us, uh, as you see, she's sort of, you know, a little bit gender non-conforming, but as often happens, she has a desperate crush on somebody else in her class. That person doesn't know, will he or won't he. There is, since it's contemporary cinema, there is also they're messaging each other on Instagram and all of those kind of things. And the fact that the boy who you see in the upper right corner is questioning his sexuality and his gender identity and is a refugee from Donetsk, now living in Kyiv, is not central to the plot. It's just completely normal and natural, and this is part of life. He's part of the community in the school. He's not bullied. He's accepted. They, it works out. And on the right, you see the poster of that uh, from the first days of a Russian shelling of Kyiv in late February. So for many Ukrainians, this became the last film they saw in theaters before the full-scale Russian invasion. And it makes all the more symbolic this powerful message of imagining different, better future. And we see that since February 24th, we have had this uh, in the middle of the horror, the coming of the being of a new place a new, uh, for the queer community within Ukraine and the new kind of activism. On the left, you see uh, posting from the Instagram of Kyiv Pride. On the right, you see an announcement of a coming uh, photography exhibition in Ukraine House in Washington, but it has already took place in Kyiv in the Taras Shevchenko Museum. So, after the war, what seemed impossible became possible in the middle of the war. We have a state institution, a major state museum, sponsoring a photography exhibit displaying of out queer people in the armed forces defending the country now. Since February 24th, Ukrainian society changed enormously in terms of its acceptance and support for the queer community. Queer people serve openly in the armed forces. Many of them have this unicorn's patch as the identification, uh, and uh, this became a sign for that. And so if you see that unicorn, um, it's either sort of, you know, shades of green or this uh, uh, red and black combination, this is what it means. But it doesn't you know, necessarily mean that uh, there are no problems. I mean, there have been issues for trans people um, and uh, because it is still a very gen gender binary legislation and in the context of the war, there have been issues with that. But these are growing pains, and what we see on the general, the tendency, the trend, how far Ukrainian society has come in these 11 months in terms of integrating and supporting and being proud of its queer community, I think is really, really remarkable. And I would like to wrap up with these two uh, pictures on the right you see a poster from london from a queer fundraiser from ukraine and from the left on a demonstration in budapest itself as you know a city in a country we're dealing with a lot of homophobia of its own where protesters are asking to protest both homophobia and russian imperialism thank you very much <laughs>